we're going to pick up where we left last time, which was with the um, support vector machine, uh, wherever that was, right here, and the um, the kernel the kernel discussion. Okay, um, so we went through the the description of the support vector machine. You know, it's basically when you're doing classification, you try to make a wide empty margin. When you're doing regression, you try to make a, a narrow margin that can, contains all of the, uh, the training data. And we were talking about um, the quadratic programming problem that you have to solve to train the support vector machine. We kind of alluded to this dual problem. Um, and then we have all of these crazy formulas. Um, and so we were getting around to, we, we presented the kernel trick last time, but let me just remind you. So this dual problem, we're not going to go over what it means, but you, you do this minimization problem that finds these alphas that, um, that satisfy all the alphas are non-negative, and then you minimize this expression, and it involves the, the data. So from that, you get your, your weight vector. So this W here is everything except for the bias weight, and this is the bias weight. <clears throat> NS is the, um, the number of support vectors. The support vectors occur for, they correspond to the alphas that are positive. And notice that only the positive alphas matter here too. So everything is expressed in terms of the, uh, the support vectors. And um, so then we were saying, when, when it's time to actually use your, your hypothesis to make a prediction here, um, you, you, know, you just take the dot product of the, uh, the instance with the weight vector, the way that we always have. Um, and this is pointing out that that can actually be done. Um, here's, here's a formula for doing that. And it only involves alphas and, and dot products with the training data. So over here, this part, which corresponds to, to B, is um, it doesn't depend on the instance that you're, that you're looking at. This is just sort of like something that you always add in. And the only place that the instance is used is right here where it gets, um, it gets XORed with the, uh, with the support vectors. And then there are um, these alphas here that kind of um, weight, the, weight the influence. And the Ys are just changing the sign. Um, OK. So the, um, the point of the kernel trick is, suppose you, you did some kind of um, high dimensional transformation of the data. For example, you add polynomial features. Um, then you would make a prediction like this, and now these fees are, um, you know, longer. So maybe X is like uh, eight features long, but after you do the feature transformation, each instance is like 300 columns long. And so, you know, you just do this instead. And the, the amazing thing about the kernel trick is that you don't actually have to do the feature transformation to get this to work. And so, that's an, an amazingly efficient because you don't have to create this gigantic data matrix that is going to take up a lot of space and slow everything down. Um, all, you, all you need is to be able to compute the dot product. So if you can compute the dot product of, of any two uh, training instances, then, um, or the dot product of, of an, you know what I'm saying. Um, if you can compute the dot product in the transform space, it doesn't matter if you actually do the transformation or not. So here, here's an example. So here's a feature transformation where we add uh, some polynomial features. And we do a dot product, and it comes out to be this. Um, but a more efficient way of doing that same dot product is just to do 1 plus the ordinary. This, so this is the non-transformed version, and then just square it, and you get exactly the same thing. So you can do the dot product in the high dimensional space without actually going to the high dimensional space. Um, and so um, a function that, that performs a, a high dimensional dot product is called a, a kernel function. And of course, the interesting case is when they don't actually explicitly do the, uh, the high dimensional transformation. Like this is called a, um, a polynomial kernel. And what it, what it does is, look, it only takes a dot product in the low dimensional space, but 
the effect is just what would happen if you if you did a feature transformation into um, like a, a degree k polynomial feature transformation and then took a dot product. It just does that without actually allocating all that space and um, spending all that time. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of a miracle. Um, and so if you you know here, if you look at these two expressions where there was this dot product in the high dimensional space, now there's just the kernel function that just uses data from the low dimensional space. So there are um, several different popular kernels. Um, the most, you know, so the, the, linear, the linear kernel is, is a kernel. And um, then we, we just talked about the, the polynomial kernel that gives you, um, polynomial feature transformation without actually needing to do the feature transformation. And you can put in some extra hyperparameters here like R and gamma and tune those if you want to. Um, there's another popular one called the, uh, the Gaussian radial basis function, <coughs> which we're gonna say some more about in just a minute. So you might wonder like um, what space is, is this thing a, a dot product for? And it's um, some crazy exponential, I'm sorry, um, infinite, it's actually an infinite dimensional vector space that this is a dot product for. So that's kind of cool. You have like an, you've, you've expanded your feature set to include infinitely many features functional, functionally, but fortunately you don't actually have to allocate all that memory, ha ha ha. Um, and this one is, is the, uh, the sig sigmoidal, sigmoidal kernel. And I believe this one doesn't actually correspond to a dot product in a high dimensional space. It still works well. Um, if you, whoa, sorry, I just wanted to highlight something. Um, if you wanna actually know um, which functions correspond to dot products in high dimensional spaces, the theorem that characterizes those is, uh, is Mercer's theorem. And um, so, you can, you can look at that Wikipedia article. Um, like kernel functions have to be symmetric. So, you know, if you switch the order of the variables, it doesn't change anything. They need to be continuous functions. And um, one quick way to see if a potential kernel will work is you just, uh, for all the training data, you make a matrix of uh, the kernel applied to instance i and instance j. So call that ij and, and let that be you know the ij entry in some matrix A. And then if A is positive semi-definite, then the conditions of Mercer's theorem are satisfied and, and K really is a dot product in some higher dimensional space. We don't even need to know what the transformation is that would make K uh, equivalent to whatever dot product it might be. We can still just use it. Um, so another another thing I want to call your attention to about these um, about these kernels is that in many ways they are similarity functions. So you know the, the dot product, so what is a, a similarity function? There's no, there's no formal definition, but um, similarity functions have high outputs, you know, big positive outputs when the inputs are similar, and then the output is like zero or negative if the inputs are dissimilar. Um, so the, the, the ordinary dot product is actually an example of that. Like um, if you just think about vectors like on the unit circle or the unit sphere or something, how do you maximize the dot product? It's, it's two vectors that point in exactly the same direction. That gives you the, the biggest dot product. If they're orthogonal, then the dot product is zero. And if they're kind of oblique, then the dot product is negative. Um, so just the ordinary dot product is, is, a, is a kind of similarity function. Um, and these, these, other, these other functions can also be construed the same way. So another way to understand what this is, uh, what this is saying here is, um, you know, here you have this, this part of the expression is just for B, so that part is always there. But when you're classifying a new instance, this is reporting on uh, similarity between the instance and the support vectors. And then you have the, um, the weighting here um, you know, adjusts, you know, saying what the influence of, of that kind of similarity should be. So in a lot of ways, this um, kernelized support vector machine 
uh, makes its decision based on um, sort of weighted similarity to the support vectors. And now we can kind of scroll through here and just look at some examples of, of using the kernels. We did this last time, but we did it really, really quickly. So this is how you would do it using sklearn. Um, here's a polynomial kernel, the degree is seven. And if you wanna tweak the hyperparameters, what we called R is called coefficient zero. Um, so this is coefficient, uh, this is a seven degree model, it's pretty good. If you do a 10 degree model, you get this weird, it looks, I don't know, it's kind of, an, it's kind of a cool picture, but it's a terrible model. <laughs> Look, the, uh, the accuracy is like zero. Um, so probably it needs to be, it needs, I don't know what it needs, something. Um, this is the, this is what you get if you just use um, the radial basis function. And when you're using the SVC library, RBF is the default. So if, you, if I actually just did it with no parameters whatsoever, it would, it would look exactly like this. This is the RBF kernel. Um, and you can see that it, it's curvy, right? So that's the advantage of the high dimensional feature transformation is that you can make decision boundaries that are not just straight lines. And um, so gamma is, is an adjustable parameter. And uh, here you can see it looks like um, making gamma big is increasing the variance. And uh, yeah, that, that makes sense. And, I'll explain more about that when we get to our next slideshow. Um, but this is like a regularization parameter. So gamma, if gamma is bigger, it's going to be curvier and there's gonna be higher variance, which will give you lower training error. Um, but the, um, the hypothesis might be overtrained to the training set. So you can see like this hypothesis that it's come up with is like very specific to this particular training set, right? That's how you can recognize when, when overfitting is happening. If the hypothesis is, is sort of like really specific to just where these individual dots happen to show up. There's the linear kernel. If you actually do wanna use a support vector machine with a linear kernel, there's um, another library that is much faster that you should use, I forget what it's called. And so here's the, the sigmoid kernel, and that's all. And here's a link to some other, some other information about kernels. These are pretty good slides. And uh, yeah. Okay. So we talked about um, Gaussian, Gaussian RBF, and I just wanted to say a few, a few more things about the, the Gaussian RBF. Um, you know, this is, this is, in a lot of ways, um, this gamma here, this is, this is very similar to just the, the, normal, the normal distribution. So let me share my little notepad here. Um, so if you look at the, the formula that defines um, just the, uh, you know, the Gaussian distribution, it's like this. And this is one dimensional. So, you know, you have like, um, X bar minus uh, Z bar or something. You know, this is, this is what this is, is the distance. Uh, yeah, so you have one vector going from the tip of X to the tip of Z, and then you get its length. Um, but in the one dimensional setting, that's just the distance between X and Z. So if you have some one dimensional X here, and you have some uh, Z over here, then that's just the that's just the distance between x and z, and you you have some constant gamma here. So what gamma is controlling? It's kind of like the uh, standard deviation, and um, kind of like the standard deviation of a normal distribution. Um, you know, if the standard deviation is really small, then these are tall and skinny. Um, but the, yeah, so I probably shouldn't be saying that because in the expression for the normal distribution, the standard deviation actually goes in the denominator, but this is in the numerator. Um, so if, if gamma is big, as gamma goes up, these, um, these curves are gonna get more narrow. So more like this. 
And that's because you've got um, e to the, it's this negative sign here. So as, as gamma gets bigger, you've got, uh, this is definitely a, um, a, positive, a positive quantity up here. And I guess I should say like gamma is greater than or equal to zero here. So the bigger gamma is, the faster this thing is gonna go to zero. So it's gonna make these uh, humps skinnier. So um, this, this height here um, is like uh, this value. And it's kind of a, um, it's like almost like a distance metric between X and Z, except it's, it's, not, it's not Euclidean distance um, because it exponentially drops off. Like, um, yeah, so, so like uh, just think of it as similarity. So this X and this Z are kind of moderately similar. But if there were some W over here, then you would have this height. And um, because this is lower, it's, it's saying that X and, and W are, are pretty dissimilar. And then if you go out much further, the similarity is going to be like zero. And um, so by making, by making gamma really big, you can make sort of the, the radius of possible non-zero similarity smaller. Um, okay, so let's come back and, and see what you can do with that. Um, all right, so now let's let's think about what happens here in the in the high dimensional space. And um, so look at look at just some point L. This is supposed to be an L in the in the high dimensional space, and just think of it as a uh, as a landmark. So it might be one of the the data points in the training set, for example. Um, so this is a kind of feature transformation that we can do. So for, uh, for a given instance, there, you can make a new feature for this instance, which is its similarity to the landmark. Um, so this is just the, the similarity of x to the landmark. It's really you know, the, the distance from x to the landmark in this or the reciprocal of the distance or something like that. But let's just think of it as uh, similarity. Um, so you can, do, uh, you can do a feature transformation. You have an instance X, but if you've set aside a bunch of landmarks, like let's just say they're K landmarks, um, instead of just using the features of X, we'll use um, these similarity measures of X to the, to the various landmarks. So you can do a, um, a feature transformation based on this. Um, so here I'm going to do an example. So here we just have some blobs of, of data like we've, like we've seen before. And um, so I've written these little functions here. But let me just skip to the picture. So what I did, I guess I should point this part out. So what are the landmarks? So there are two landmarks. One landmark is the, the mean of the orange ones. So that's the dot right in the center of the orange ones. And the other landmark is the mean of the blue ones. So that's the dot right in the center of the, uh, the blue swarm there. And instead of using these X and Y um, features that the data set naturally came with, we're gonna use um, the Gaussian the Gaussian radial basis function similarity measure instead. So this axis now, this horizontal axis, is similarity to landmark one. Um, and this other axis is similarity to landmark two. Um, so this point you know, is very similar to landmark two. So what that means is that it's really close um, to the mean of the orange ones. Um, and so all of the orange ones are closer to the mean of the orange set. And all of the blue ones are closer to the mean of the blue ones. And so you just get the same points, but now in a different feature space. So this might, you know, you can see how this could make something that's not linearly separable become linearly separable, kind of shake it around a little bit. Um, so here is, uh, here's a picture that shows the, the original blobs. Um, but what I've done here is I've I've plotted um, I've plotted also the the RBF similarity to the landmarks. 
So here's the here's one landmark at the center of the orange spots. And so yellow means very similar to, to that landmark. And then you can see that similarity sort of drops off exponentially towards zero. So this is like a two-dimensional version of a of a normal distribution. You know, it's like instead of being a a, a hump like that, that's a mountain. And here's another little mountain. And so now the new features are sort of how how high you are up each mountain. So this one is out in the valley, you know, but um, but still, it's, even though we can't really see it on this contour plot, there's like, for this one, you're going to be able to tell if you look at the raw numbers that it's closer to that mountain than that mountain. So this is how you can make classifications. You know, you can train a linear model on these new features, and then it will sort of categorize these things according to what their relationship is with these two mountains. So if it's closer to this mountain and further than that, further from that mountain, then it'll be blue and vice versa. So I'm actually um, gonna, gonna apply this to a concrete example <laughs> with, the, with the concrete regression, uh, regression problem um, that, we've, that we've used a few times before. So I do, I do a test train split here, and it turns out there are you know, about, about 800 training points and about um, 250 test points here. And so first, I, I just, as a baseline, let's do basic linear regression here. And this is the R2 score, and it's like 0.6, which is not great. We know from, from previous experience, like the, um, the random forest re regressor can go as high as like um, a, an R2 of 0.9 on this data set. So 0.6 is not very good. But look at, look at this approach. So what I'm doing here <clears throat> is I'm, I'm just selecting at random 200 instances from the training set. And I'm just going to declare those to be landmarks. So some of those, you know, this is, this is actually a regression problem now um, instead of a classification problem. Um, but still, like, the, um, when you make a prediction, it's going to, oh, I'm just doing a feature transformation, right? So each, each point in the, in, in the, um, the data matrix is just going to be replaced by sort of its place in this landscape of mountains, you know, like how far it is from each mountain, basically, when um, the thing that's measuring distance is the radial basis function. So we, we do the feature transformation here to get um, Z train and, and Z test. And then I just still use a linear model just like before. So I'm still doing linear regression, it's just on the new features. And the performance is much better. And then if you if you tweak gamma, you can you can make it a little bit better. And this is like pretty close to 0.88 here, which is getting, you know, it's not as good as the random forest regressor, but this is close to the best model that we've seen on this data set. So, you know, this can be pretty effective. When you add so many features, it it slows, you know, slows things down. Um, but it's interesting that you can do that. So this is, this is beginning to be something called an, an instance-based model. And um, in, the next, in the next set of slides here, we're going to talk about the, uh, the champion instance-based model, which is K nearest neighbors. But what an instance-based uh, model is, is a model, um, you know, most of the models that we've seen so far, you give it some training data. And it kind of boils down the essence of those data points into like a couple of parameters, you know, like the slope of some hyperplane or something. Um, so, you know, I might give it 10,000 training points, but then it, it just, what it learns from that is like the value of like seven weights that determine some hyperplane in, in high dimensions. So in instance-based methods, you don't do that kind of data compression. You don't sort of, ex you know, melt it all down and extract the bottom line from, from the training points. You just keep them around. And then you use them directly to, to make predictions in the future, which makes training fast, uh, but it can make prediction kind of slow. So we've, we've kind of, now we're moving towards this in increments because this is sort of like what the support vector machine was doing with the kernel. You know, it kept, uh, 
it didn't keep all the training points around. It just kept the support vectors around. But it was it it just it remembered those those training instances that were in the support vectors, and then it was using those to make predictions. And then the same thing here with the um, with this RBF uh, feature transform. It keeps the landmarks around, and then it uses the landmarks to uh, to make predictions in the future. And um, so now we're going to go even further with uh, with K nearest neighbors. K nearest neighbors. Sorry, keeps... I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I got a question. I hear you. Uh, uh, go back to the next slide. Uh, the RBF slide. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that uh, in line uh, 46 and 45, uh, all that change is the gamma is one half. That's right. So what does that gamma do? do? So, um, yeah. So that's a that's a good question. So gamma. Let me see if I can. Let me run all above here. Hopefully this won't take too long. And um, now we're we're making this picture. Okay, I think we're good. So in this picture, gamma is uh, 0.1. So let me change gamma in this picture to be one. And you can see what happened here is that the the mountains became skinny. Um, so now you can't you can't see it as well from the contour plot. But what happened is now they are like Dr. Seuss mountains. They're tall and very skinny. So the influence of the of each landmark doesn't extend as far. Um, so you have to be really close to this mountain before before the feature corresponding to that mountain has a high value. Um, so if you if you relax gamma, if you make gamma smaller then that makes the, the mountain spread out again. So if I make gamma really small, like 1,000th, um, now, now the mountains are so big that they're actually kind of combining with each other. So maybe I'll try 0.01. And they're still kind of, they're combining with each other. Um, but you know, this is informative because it shows like, you know, now you can't easily tell which mountain you're close to because the influence of each mountain extends further. So there's like a sweet spot. Um, which for this data set, I think is about 0.1. Um, so, you know, now the, the red instances have kind of a high value for, for their landmark and the blue instances have kind of a high value for their landmark. But basically what, um, what gamma controls is how, how skinny those mountains are. Good question. Okay, so let's go to K nearest neighbors. Um, so I didn't I didn't write a, a big um, intro here. I do I do have some pictures set aside though. Uh, not that one. This one. Okay. Has it, anybody ever seen a picture like this before? Uh, you sometimes you, you know even in real life like. Uh, you know, suppose that these blue dots, what's happened here is this, this is something called a Voronoi diagram. And it's sometimes it's also called a soap bubble diagram because soap bubbles will do this. Um, so each cell is the set of points in the plane that are closest to the blue point in that cell. So everything inside this cell is closer to that point than any other point here. Um, and everything in this cell is closer to that point than any other point. See how it works? So you, you can see this happening like in a, to consider like a airports in the United States. Like uh, if these blue dots are airports, then everybody in this cell will logically want to utilize that airport because that's the airport that's closest to where they live. You know. Um, Okay, and some people think that we should, you know, this could fix ger gerrymandering or something by using Voronoi diagrams or more equitable ways of making congressional districts. So this is um, this is the basic idea between uh, k nearest k nearest neighbors. So k nearest neighbors can be used for either classification or or regression. And it's just based on uh, similarity to the, the training data. 
So, you know, k is supposed to be the, some variable number of neighbors, but let's just say it, it's like one nearest neighbor. So if you, if you have some, some new data point here and it shows up in this cell, um, then the nearest neighbor is that. And um, now if you're doing classification, you're gonna make this new instance be the same class as that guy. Or if you're doing a regression, then you're going to make the output be the same as whatever his output is. So you just um, you just copy whatever whatever the output is for the the nearest the nearest neighbor. Um, and usually to to smooth things out, instead of just using the nearest neighbor, you you take the average of a few nearest neighbors. Like in the in the scikit-learn library, I think the average is five. So if, um, and I think we can go back to the, back to the slides now. So I made an example. So I'll come back to that code in a second. Um, but here's, here's some training blobs, you know, like we always deal with. And um, it's kind of annoying because it's not showing my pictures. Can you see that picture, please? Yeah, so here, here's an orange, orange part and a blue part. And here's some new instance, the green star, which we want to classify. Um, and we're going to do it using um, three nearest neighbors. So that's nearest neighbors with k equals three. So we look at the, the three nearest neighbors to that guy, which are highlighted in pink here. And um, so all of them are blue. So you want to predict that the new instance will also be blue. Um, so that's not exactly the average. Well, it is. It is the. It is the average here. But suppose that one of one of the neighbors happened to be orange. Um, then what? What do you do? Then you have like um, two blues and one orange. So you you pick the majority. And the way the way you express that in code is you want uh, you want the mode. So let's just go quickly over here, and and look at how this works. Um, so um, you know, k nearest neighbors depends on a definition of nearest, and um, there are several different notions of of distance you could use. Um, this. Uh, this is covered in a supplemental chapter in our textbook, Learning from Data, and you can, you can read there about Malinobis distance and uh, Jacquard distance. Um, there are a few, a few different distance metrics that you can try. Um, I've just got Euclid, just regular Euclidean distance here. Um, if you look at the documentation for scikit-learn, they, they give you something called the uh, Minkowski distance. And that's just like a generalization of uh, Euclidean distance. Let's actually take a quick look at the, uh, the Wikipedia page here. Um, so this is this is the Minkowski distance. So it's the the pth root of the sum of um, of x minus p to the pth power. Um, so just this is when when p is two, this is just Euclidean distance. This is just the the norm. So this is, in other words, when p is two, this is just the Pythagorean theorem. And then you can you can change you can change p, and it changes the um, the shape of um, space a, a little bit. Um, but I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just saying what it is. Um, okay. So you get the distance, the distances from uh, from every point in the in the training set to the new instance, and so you go through here and you just pick out the three nearest nearest neighbors. So the nearest um, distance is that. This is actually the index of the nearest distance. Um, and remember the neighbor is going to be, we're going to remember the index of the nearest neighbor here and put it in our list and then sort of scratch this one out because this one is done. So this is like um, three steps in selection sort. So selection sort is going to be faster than some other way of doing this as long as k is, you know, fairly small, like, um, you know, like less than 100 or something. And 
this uh, this takes a this takes a long time because it um, you have to go through every single training point at least three times, and so if you have ten thousand training points to make one prediction, you have to look at um, ten thousand things, and then if you want to make ten thousand predictions, you're going to have to do look at the 10,000 points 10,000 times, and then it starts getting really expensive. So like on a big data set, um, K nearest neighbors is gonna be really fast for training because there is no training. You just, um, you, all, the, all the predictions are just based directly on the training set, but the predictions are gonna take forever. You're gonna have to go through the entire training set a whole bunch of times um, for, each, for each, each prediction. Um, so, so then when you use this, so all this does is it, it gets the, it gets the K nearest neighbors right here. And then if you're doing regression, um, your prediction is the, the mean output for those neighbors. And if you're doing classification, it's just the mode. So the mode is the most common value. So if, um, if neighbor one says, you know, red, neighbor two says green, and neighbor three says red, then the mode is red because that's the most common uh, class. So it just, um, it just reports the most common class among the K nearest neighbors. Whereas in, in regression, you just return the mean. Um, and there are fancier things you could do, like um, you know, a closer neighbor might be more informative than a more distant neighbor. So there are distance weighting schemes I have no idea. Yeah. So maybe this some point in here has three nearest neighbors, but but this neighbor is much closer than the other two neighbors. So um, maybe you want to weight the influence such that the the, the neighbor that's closer um, influences the predicted value for this new instance a lot more than the other two neighbors that are um, they're still the closest neighbors, but they're not as close as this guy. So their opinion should count less because the new instance is not as similar to them as it is to this. So you can use a distance weighting scheme. And like a common thing to do is to like weight the influence as uh, one over D, where D is the distance of the instance to whatever neighbor. And I didn't implement that, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll show you how to do it from the, the scikit-learn library. Okay, um, all right, so the effect of the choosing the number of neighbors, actually in, um, in, in the notes that Tyler gave us a long time ago about bias and variance, um, it explained the whole idea of bias and variance in terms of K nearest neighbors. Um, so if you, if, you, if you look at this problem, what, what's, what's, what we're doing here is we're changing the, near, the number of neighbors that we consider. So this is if you just, if you just copy your, nearest neighbor singular, so you just pay attention to the, the guy who's nearest, then you get a decision boundary that looks like this, which is kind of like, you know, ragged. And it depends a lot on where these particular points happen to fall. Um, so in other words, this is high variance, low bias, and it's a little bit overfitting this data. It looks kind of tattered. It's um, not really getting like the, uh, you know, picking up on the probability distribution that generated the data. It's like minim actually memorizing the data that we ha just happened to get. And the same thing here with three neighbors, still pretty rough. Um, and then as you add more and more neighbors, it starts to smooth out and be less curvy and be more straight. So now bias has gone up and variance has gone down. And, you know, there's a trade-off. Uh, so the, the number of neighbors with a lot of neighbors, you have uh, low variance, high bias. With too few neighbors, you have um, high variance, low bias. And then you, it's a hyperparameter that you have to tune. You just have to find the sweet spot for your particular data. So here it looks like, I don't know, k equals 15 is pretty good. Also, the, the more neighbors you add, the slower it's going to go. So that's another consideration. Here's the same thing, but on a different data set. So this is on the moon's data. So here's one neighbor, three neighbors, 
15 neighbors, 25 neighbors. So it gets, um, you know, the, the steep parts go away and everything kind of flattens out. What would happen in an extreme case if you just took the average of all the points? <laughs> What would that model look like if it was just the average of every training point? Or sorry, the mode of every training point. It would just be like either solid green or solid yellow, depending on whether there are more positives or negatives. So in an extreme case, when the number of neighbors is like everything, then it's um, just going to be either. So it's really, really simple. It's just constant prediction. Um, so here's here's some. We're gonna we're gonna play with uh, the iris data set. The iris data set is uh, really, really commonly used for illustrating things in in machine learning and other statistical settings. Um, it uh, it was compiled by Fisher, and I believe Fisher is um is he the eugenicist a lot i think he's a eugenicist i don't know if you can really hold that against him let's see yeah eugenics um so this guy was a, a very famous statistician who was also a little bit of a nazi but anyway so now we have this uh this iris iris data set and what it's based on is um, telling the, the difference between three different species of iris and they are um, iris, seti, uh, iris setosa, and iris versicolor, and iris virginica. So he collected uh, data on these plants, and the things that he measured are um, petal length, petal width, sepal length, and sepal width. I thought this was going to tell us what a sepal is. I believe this Wikipedia page used to say what a sepal is. Um, so some of these are, are petals and then some of them are sepals. So he measures um, petal length, petal width, uh, sepal length, and, se and sepal width. So that's four, four dimensions of data. And then the goal here is to um, tell the difference, like, you know, correctly predict whether an iris that you encounter is um, whatever species. So here are the, um, the two-dimensional projections. So this is sepal length. Um, on one axis and then petal length on another axis. So the, the data points live in four dimensions, but we can we can predict you know project them down into two dimensional slices by just considering two attributes at a time. So if you just look at sepal length and petal length, then it projects the data down onto two dimensions, and you get you get something that looks like this. And you can see there are lots of different possible projections. Um, later in the class, we'll talk about kind of an optimal way to make these kind of proje uh, projections. Um, for now, we're just choosing two features at a time, and, and some of them work pretty well, but um, none of them none of them are linearly separable. And also, this is the first time we've looked at a problem where there are multiple classes. And I wanted to do that just because the um, the k-nearest neighbor algorithm, it doesn't make a binary prediction, like the linear classifier you're either on one side of the boundary or you're on the other side of the boundary. So it's just, it's naturally a binary classifier. But k-nearest neighbor is our first example of something that is naturally a multi-class classifier. Because if there are, you know, three different classes, which there are here, um, you could just um, make a prediction for a new instance, predict that it's the same species as its nearest neighbor. So you can naturally handle multi-class uh, classification. Um, so here I do a test train split, and I just wanted to, to point out um, briefly um, this parameter here, stratify. So when you turn stratify on, right now I have it off, um, if you turn it on, it forces the test set and the training set to be representative. And this is a pretty, this is a very balanced data set here. They're the same number of each flower type. But you can imagine a data set where there are maybe not very many zeros at all. And in a case like that, it's possible that um, when you do your test train split, like all of the rare ones end up either in the training set or the test set. And so that would be bad. So if you turn stratify on, I think you turn it on like this. Um, whoa. 
um, you turn on stratify and then uh, the histogram is going to be flat so it, it tries to make it tries to give equal representation to each class in the test set and usually that's better you especially want to turn it on if you have a very unbalanced uh, data set okay so here we, we make a bunch of predictions and then you can look at the uh, the error rate and you know when you judge the error rate for multi-class classification you have to give it a little bit of a break because um, there's several ways you can be wrong here and um, you can use some, something called a confusion matrix that, that can show you exactly where the mistakes are taking place here. So I, what, this, what this is, is each, um, each row here corresponds to the true flower type. So this, um, this row is zero, and so this is, this is telling you what happens when zero is the truth. When zero is the truth, zero is predicted 10 out of 10 times. So there's no problem here. Um, by the way, zero corresponds to setosa. So there's no problem in correctly identifying setosas. Um, now the, the next row is one, and one corresponds to versicolor. So this is what happens when the truth is versicolor. When the truth is versicolor, versicolor is predicted 17 out of 17 times. No problem there. And now this third row is, um, I guess it must be what's left, um, two and two is um, Virginica. So when Virginica, when Virginica is the truth, um, nine out of 11 times Virginica is predicted but here's where all the error is coming from. It's just confusing. Um, something that's truly Virginica is wrongly predicted to be Versicolor. So this can be you know, interesting and useful for helping to fix some problem that your model might be having. It's called the confusion matrix. And it just tells you, you know, about, um, you could even do it for binary classification because then you see uh, false negatives and false positives in, the, um, in these corner positions. Okay. Um, so here's a here's one of the two-dimensional projections of um, of the data that we we saw earlier. I forget which one it is. Um, I'm picking the first column and the third column. So we're just we're just throwing away all the other columns and just remembering the first column and the third column. Now we get this two-dimensional picture here, and we're going to use the um, k nearest neighbors to do multi-class classification here. Um, so here's what it looks like for uh, various choices of k. So for k equals one, it's a little bit more ragged. You have sort of like these little tattered places and stuff. Um, and then as the number of neighbors goes up, the boundaries get smoother and less complicated. And um, yeah, it doesn't change much after a while. So this is like the um, as smooth as it gets here with 25 neighbors. Um, Okay, so it naturally does multi-class classification. That's cool. Um, so do neural networks and um, decision trees and also naive bays. We're gonna try to talk about um, neural networks and decision trees. I don't think we'll get to naive bays. Maybe we will. Um, so how do you use um, K nearest neighbors for regression? We've actually already written that function. You've kind of seen the, uh, this is the code. So where classification uses the mode, regression just uses the mean. Otherwise the code is exactly the same. You just find the three nearest neighbors. Um, okay. So let's come down here. So here's a little regression problem. I think this is, this is a sine curve with some noise added to it. And, um, Here's what happens when you do regression with, uh, with one neighbor. And you can see it's high variance. It's got like a, a lot of steep parts. It's kind of, um, and it's specific to the particular training set that we happen to get. It's not, it's not picking up on the probability distributions too much. It's being influenced by the particular data points that we happen to get in our training set. So that means the variance is kind of high. 
And then the, um, the more neighbors you add, the more it smooths out. So six and then 10 and then 15. So this is you know, a hyperparameter that you have to train. Um, notice that at the, at the ends here, it only gets neighbors on one side because there are no neighbors to the left. All the neighbors are to the right. So it kind of biases it in favor of being too high because all the neighbors over here are a little bit higher. And the opposite thing happens. No, this, the same thing happens over here because all the, all the neighbors are a little bit higher over here. So it gives the, the red line a little bit of an incorrect bias toward high values there at the end. Okay, so let's do it on a, a real data set, a concrete example, so to speak. And um, so here's what you get for, for different, different numbers of neighbors. It turns out on this data set, one neighbor works best. This is the R2 score. So you get like an R2 score of uh, 0.73. Uh, which is nowhere near as good as the radial basis function, but um, you can make it a little bit better. So I said that there, there is that trick you can do where you, you weight the influence by distance, and that turns out to be really effective here. Um, I also tried changing the, the P. This is, from, uh, the, this is the P from Minkowski distance, changing this P. You know, when P is two, it's just Euclidean distance, but you can make P other things. Turns out that for this data set, it works best when P is just two. So in other words, it's just using Euclidean distance. And the, um, the R2 score goes up quite a, quite a bit there. All right, so that's the, um, the end of the stuff that I was gonna say about, um, about k-nearest neighbors. I was gonna say, I was gonna launch into something about precision and recall, but it's pretty close to the end of class. Anybody have any questions on anything? Well, I don't wanna waste even these two minutes. <laughs> so let's, let's say a couple of things about precision and recall. Um, I guess maybe I should say them with the, um, not with this, we're not ready for this. Uh, let's just give the definitions and then we'll, um, next time we can talk about precision and recall. Um, so so far we've been looking at data sets that have um, pretty that are pretty balanced. You know the same number of positive neg instances as negative instances and so forth. You probably got a glimpse of the worksheet that I just looked at. It's the uh, the MNIST handwriting data set. So if you look at the MNIST handwriting data set, let's just say that you're trying to pick out all the threes. You're going to have um, so only one tenth of the data is actually threes. Ninety percent of it is not three; it's some other number. So um, if you train your classifier and it just says three all the time, um, it's going to be right ninety percent of the time. Um, uh, but it's going to miss all of the threes. <laughs> so it's got ninety percent accuracy, but it doesn't pick out a single three. Um, so that's not good. So in order to sort of quantify how, so accuracy is not a good measure of performance when you have a very unbalanced data set. Like another example is cancer. So suppose 99% of your samples are benign. And so you just say that everything is benign and you have an, a classifier that's 99% accurate, congratulations. And it's gonna kill everybody that has cancer because you don't pick out a single, uh, you don't flag a single instance of a person having cancer. So the way that the metrics that we use um, to detect these things are precision and recall. So precision, what precision is, um, when you say something is true, like let's say that I flag something and I predict that it really is a three. Um, this is the percentage of my, my tr predictions of true that actually are true. Um, so this is um, the number of uh, times we say uh, true. No, 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 no. So, so um, of the times that we say to, true, so when we say true, Um, this is the percentage of times that we're actually correct. 
So it's our true positives divided by the total number of positives. So TP is true positives, and it's divided by the total number of positives. So the total number of positives is the number of true positives um, plus the number of um, false negatives. And I'm a moron, so let me just check. Uh, No, this is not right. Shoot, I should have quit the video when I was ahead. I had just like cobbled this stuff together and I shouldn't have mentioned it. So I'll just um, retreat in disgrace and come back here and stop the, uh, stop the recording.